Okay, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> we got up through uh, the Boggart in the wardrobe. Ended with, I mean, we obviously skipped a lot, um, but ended with the end of the Boggart in the wardrobe and Harry not getting to challenge the Boggart or the Boggart challenge here. Um, on a skip, yeah, you can skip Flight of the Fat Lady. There's just little plot stuff there. Um, and I'm going to go to Grim Defeat towards the end of it. <clears throat> I'm going to try and finish Azkaban today. I came in thinking that I might offer you what I offered my Tuesday, Thursday course, which was let you just watch a, a video to conclude Azkaban and jump into Goblet of Fire today. But then I looked at the syllabus. And I have no idea how this happened. Um, got a lot more days for Cop Little Fire for this class than I do for my Tuesday, Thursday. And I know this class is a little bit shorter. Um, something's going to pull up there. Uh, anyways, so I want to pick up with the Quidditch match 178.79. Gryffindor is playing Hufflepuff. And Wood has told Harry on the previous page, 177, I believe, we're up 50 points, but we're not going to win unless you catch the snitch, etc. You know, do anything necessary. And Harry sees the snitch, and the bottom of 178, he and Cedric are both going for it, and Harry looks down, and there's 100 Dementors, we're told. Looking up, And Harry hears, page 179, not Harry, not Harry, please, not Harry. Stand aside, you silly girl, stand aside now. Not Harry, please, no, take me, kill me instead. And Harry's, you know, mom's going to be murdered, blah, blah, blah. He was falling, falling through the icy mist. Not Harry, please, have mercy, have mercy. And he hits the ground, his broom flies off and gets the, I was going to say snot, but that doesn't fit the metaphor, gets the tar beat out of it, you know, so to speak, uh, by the Whomping Willow. And we come to chapter 10, the Marauder's Map. Okay. He hadn't told anybody about seeing the Grim, top of page 184. He'd fallen, you know, 50 feet from his broomstick. Harry's thinking the Grim is out to get him. The only reason he knows about a Grim is because Trelawney mentioned it in her first day of class and such. Okay? It's a, you know, it's a, it's not a premonition. It's a harbinger of coming, it's not necessarily death, bad fortune, usually often death, etc. So, they go to Defense Against the Dark Arts class, and Snape, uh, excuse me, and Lupin is back, okay? And they talk to Lupin, page 185, and they say, you know, Snape, um, and they say, Snape, assign us two rolls of parchment on werewolves, okay? And if we were to back up and go to that class, you know, Snape, would, Snape gets all been out of shape because they can't identify, they can't recognize the signs of a werewolf, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Jump forward for a minute, and we're going to have, later on in the book, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it is later on, it's obvious. We're going to have another scene where <coughs> um, Snape's going to take over the class, et cetera. And Lupin's going to come back, and Lupin's going to assign an essay about what? Anybody remember? Vampires. It's one of Rowling's little breadcrumbs to send us off on the wrong trail. Okay? Just as Snape did werewolves. Why? Because he wants the students to know what? Lupin's a werewolf. Okay? Who picks up on that? One person, 
for mighty does. Okay? So, page 186. Harry's talking with Lupin afterwards. And Lupin says, I'd like a word with you. It's about the match. Talked about the Whomping Willow, you know, beating the snot out of his wand and such. Says it was planted the same year I started. And then 187. Harry says, why do the Dementors affect me like that? Am I just... And we get a dash, question mark, and I think what the dash is implying is Harry doesn't want to say the word, and Lupin doesn't let him finish the sentence. Okay? Am I just, and Lupin says, it has nothing to do with weakness. He knows where Harry's going, and he's, no, Harry, you're not weak. The Dementors affect you worse than the others because there are horrors in your past that the others don't have. Okay? Look at that word, by the way. <coughs> Dementors. Rowling invents that word. Okay. Had not existed before. This word existed before, obviously. That word goes back hundreds of years. And this word existed before. To be demented means to be out of your mind. Okay? So a dementor is one who makes you demented out of your mind. Just look at the root. The root is this, okay? Not um, gender, okay? It's, it goes back to Latin, men's mind. The mentor is one who does what? Every one of you, you've got a major, or you will have a major, and in that major, you're going to be given, if you haven't already, a, an advisor to help you, you know, Navigate what courses you've got to take, etc. Fill out your candidacy for graduation, the whole nine yards. What's that person supposed to do? Or in a job, maybe you have a mentor. They're to help you grow. They're to help guide you, direct you in that path. Okay? So that's what a mentor does. So what's a de-mentor do? Stops the growth denies the guidance, destroys the mind. Right? What is the worst thing, Lupin's going to tell us, a Dementor can do? Give you the Dementor's kiss. And, you know, and notice how Rowling kind of plays with the idea of this kiss. You know, if you think of not just a peck on the cheek, but a full mouth-on, open-mouth kiss, what's the Dementor do? Sucks your soul out, we're told. Leaving what? An empty body, a husk. The body's still alive. What would we call that in kind of a medical condition? Catatonic state, coma, vegetative state. So you can be in a coma and still come out of it. Generally, it's thought if you're in a true vegetative state, there's no coming out. There are no brain waves. In a coma, there are still brain waves. Okay? So that's when he goes on, page 187. Dementors are among the foulest creatures that walk this earth. They infest the darkest places, the darkest, filthiest places. They glory in decay and despair. They drain peace, hope, and happiness out of the air <coughs> around them. Even muggles feel their presence. Jump to book five. Though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor and every good feeling, every happy memory will be sucked out of you. If it can, the Dementor will feed on you long enough to reduce you to something like itself. Soulless and evil. You'll be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. And the worst that happened to you, Harry, is enough to make anyone fall off their broom. You've got nothing to feel ashamed of. What's the worst that happened to Harry? The being beaten up by Dudley, you know, once a week for the first 10 years of his life? No, that's bad. 
It's what happened a few months after his first birthday. When as a baby, even though he was unconscious of it, that is, he didn't see what happened in processing. Think about it. He saw what? He saw his mother murdered in front of his very eyes. He didn't see his father. It happened in a different room. But he saw his mother murdered. That's going to come up later on in the book five. Right? When they get near me, I can hear Voldemort murdering my mom. Notice what Lupin doesn't do right there. I think it's the second time Harry's used the name with Lupin. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't, you know, wipe his head. He doesn't go, oh, you said the name. All right. Why? What does Dumbledore say to Harry about calling things by their proper names? He says, fear of the name increases the fear of the thing. Call it by its proper name. And later on, book five, okay, giving something away if you haven't read it, we're going to have a scene with, I almost said Tolkien, with Dumbledore and Voldemort. And what is Dumbledore going to call Lord Voldemort? Tom. He calls him by his real name. He doesn't call him by the name he wants to. We could get all political. He doesn't call him by the name he wants to identify as. He's, he's essentially saying, your right to self-identity. Uh -uh. No. It does not invade my right to understand reality. Okay, You might call yourself Lord Voldemort, but one, you're not a lord. And two, Try as you may, you cannot flee from death. I just wish in that scene he had called him Tommy, just to belittle him even more. All right? So, Harry, why'd they come to the match? Lupin, they're hungry. All right? Azkaban must be terrible. Right? These things guard Azkaban. And Lupin describes it, and then Harry says, Sirius Black escaped. He got away. Yeah, Black must have found a way. Harry, you made the Dementor break off. Well, there are defenses, okay? So Lupin says, I'll try and help. Um, Fred and George give him the Marauder's Map. They show him how it works. Bottom of page 192. <coughs> they tap on it. Messrs. Moody, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, purveyors of aids to magical mischief makers, are proud to present the Marauder's Map, right? And they show them what it does. It shows you all the detail of Hogwarts Castle and Grounds, right? So not only the kind of like physical structure, you know, the footprint of the castle and all the rooms, right? But it also shows you every burning thing in the castle and all the grounds until it gets to the end or the edges of that property. And then it's, you know, like terra incognita, unknown land, so to speak. All right. And Harry thinks, page 194, of Mr. Weasley's voice, you know, at the end of Chamber of Secrets, where Mr. Weasley says, you know, never trust something that, you know, you don't know where it keeps its brain or that can think for itself. And Harry's thinking, eh, I don't know about this. I mean, Fred and George, they're a lot of fun, right? Fred and George are also what? They're kind of out there on the edge. They're, they're pushing that fun envelope a little bit, you know. Weasley's wizarding wheezes kind of a thing that we'll get in the next book. So, Harry uses it to go into Hogsmeade. 
and pages, oh, I don't know, 202 and following, to the end of that chapter. What does Harry get as a result of using the Marauder's Map? Let me ask that another way. The first way still works, but let me ask it another way too. What does Harry suffer as a result of using the Marauder's Map? What does he learn? The lead up to what happened, okay. More detail, anybody. He learns who Sirius Black is to him. Meaning, somebody else, what is Sirius Black's relation to Harry? Godfather. Godfather. And betrayer of his parents. So his godfather betrayed his parents. How does he learn all this? Uh, not quite. He's in the three broomsticks, right? With Ron and Hermione. The others pull up a table next to them. Ron and Hermione push Harry down. Right? He's got his invisibility cloak, but he still, you know, hides and stuff. And he overhears this conversation between McGonagall, Madame Rosemarja, who else? Hagrid, Cornelius Spudge, who else? Flitwick. Billy is Flitwick, right? Okay. So, Minister of Magic, groundskeeper, McGonagall is what? She's the deputy headmaster, headmistress, so she's in charge when Dumbledore's not there, you know, charms professor, Madame Rosemerta. What's her job? What's her purpose? She's a barman. That's it. Okay. However, her name is rolling, pulling in Celtic mythology. Because Rosemerta was the goddess of drink. In Celtic mythology. Okay. So they all have a bit to drink, and all of this comes out. And Harry hears all of it. Notice, is Harry invited to this conversation? No. This is what I was getting at with the original question. He's eavesdropping. Rowling makes pretty clear. Throughout all seven books, you really should never eavesdrop. Even if what you learn might be quote unquote good, there's always a dark aspect to that. You know, um, beginning of this book, Harry accidentally overhears Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, right? He doesn't hear the full story. This is the problem of eavesdropping. You don't get all the information. Book five, book six, book seven, prophecy. I won't say anything else. Okay. So, Fudge talks about meeting Black. And he was in his right mind. He asked, could I read your newspaper? And he was like, I, I don't understand why that happened that way. Page 209 and such. And we're told... The others leave, bottom of 210, and Hermione and Ron look down under the table at Harry. Harry? You okay, Harry? All right. 211. Harry didn't have a very clear idea of how he managed to get back into the Honeyduke's cellar. Why not? Have you ever been doing something Driving, maybe. <clears throat> this has happened to me before. When I was your age, was an undergraduate, 
at a liberal arts college outside Chattanooga, you know, at the end of the semester, I would drive back home to San Jose, California, South Bay, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, about 25, 2,600 miles. And I would do that in one drive, anywhere from 33 to 39 hours, okay? There were parts of that drive that I wouldn't remember later on, not because I fell asleep, but because my mind went somewhere else. Harry doesn't remember how he got back. Why? What's he thinking about? Serious Black. What did he tell Mr. Weasley? I'm not going to go looking for trouble. Now, what's Harry want? He wants to go look for trouble. The trouble being named Serious Black, right? Top of 213. A hatred such as he had never known before was coursing through Harry like poison. Go back to the previous page, 212. Second full paragraph. Remember at the end of the first book, I think it was? Maybe it might have been the second book. Hagrid gave Harry a photo album. Okay. Harry turns and he looks at the picture of his parents' wedding day. There's his father waving up at him. There's his mother. And there's their best man. And Harry had never thought about before. But now, that picture of the best man has a name associated with it. The best man, in Harry's mind, is the worst man. Because he killed his parents. He could see Black laughing at him through the darkness, etc., etc., he could hear what Black's voice might have been like. It has happened, my lord. The potters have made me their secret, secret, blah, blah, blah. Got it? It's the first day of the holidays. It's Christmas break. Hermione says, 2.14. Harry, you must be really upset over what you learned, heard yesterday. Don't do anything stupid like what? Like trying to go after Black, says Ron. You won't, will you? Asked Hermione, because Black's not worth dying for, says Ron. You know what I see in here every time a Dementor gets too near? Has he told them anything about why he passes out when Dementors come here? No, he hasn't. I can hear my mom screaming and pleading with Voldemort. <coughs> and if you'd heard your mom screaming, just about to be killed, you wouldn't forget it in a hurry. Pause for a moment and go back to the end of Philosopher's Stone. Okay? Just before he goes through the trap door, what does he tell Ron and Hermione? He knows the stone is there. He knows, he thinks, Snape is after it. And if Snape gets it, what's going to happen? Voldemort will come back. And he tells them, because Hermione says, Harry, you'll get expelled. He says, it's not about house points anymore. Don't you understand what will happen? Voldemort will come back. He will flatten Hogwarts or something. And then he says, I'm never going over to the dark side. Right? Who asked him? Who in the course of that novel said, Harry Potter, come join with me. and Together we will rule the galaxy. Back. The closest you get is little Draco Malfoy on the train saying, Harry, would you be my friend? I can help you make friends with the right people. Okay? When he, when he says that, he has no idea of this. But when he's saying this, he does have an idea of what Voldemort is like now because he's met him. Well, the quasi him pasted on the back of somebody's head. If you found out someone who was supposed to be a friend of hers betrayed her, sent Voldemort after her, Hermione, there's nothing you can do. The Dementors will catch Black. He'll go back to Azkaban. Harry, you heard what Fudge said. Black isn't affected by Azkaban. Jump to the end of the novel. Why isn't Black affected? Why does he tell us in just a few moments, because we're going to go to it quickly. Why wasn't he affected? What do the Dementors feed on? Happiness, happy thoughts, joyful thoughts. 
Is black rightly or wrongly in Azkaban? Wrongly. Is that a happy thought? Imagine you're one of the sheesh over the last 10, 15 years. You're one of the 100 or 200 men who have been sent to death row and you're wasting away in prison for a crime you didn't commit. That later DNA evidence, or maybe DNA evidence at the time, but the prosecutors hit it, you know, showed you didn't do the rape, murder, etc. that you've been convicted of. A guy was, just a couple of years ago, this is when Trump was still president, a guy who'd been on death row for like 35 or 40 years was released. Because of DNA evidence that absolved him. And he came out, and he was a little bitter, but he was like, you know, at least I'm free from that. And he said, he made the comment, you know, I could survive because I knew I was innocent. Black says the same thing, all right? So, Harry keeps using the word Voldemort. Ron, finally, 2.15. Say you know who, will you? So obviously the Malfoys knew Black was working for Voldemort. In other words, middle finger to Ron. And Malfoy would love to see you get blown into about a million pieces. Hermione, come on, Harry, please. Black did a terrible thing. Don't do that. All right. So they go down to Hagrid's. <coughs> when they go down to Hagrid's, define or describe Harry's state of mind. Louder. Pissed. He's pissed. Pissed is, is, it's a nice general verb, right? It doesn't get quite the extent of how angry Harry is. He's how angry. You know, there's a phrase that's sometimes used. Spitting nails, angry. If this were a Bugs Bunny cartoon, how would he appear? Steam would be coming out of the ears, right? Why is he going down to Hagrid's? Because he's going to demand answers. 13-year-old Harry Potter is going to go down and verbally beat up 66-year-old, I think he is at this point, 65 years old, Hagrid, right? One of them mentions going down to Hagrid's, and Hermione's, no, Harry's not supposed to leave the castle. Harry's not, yeah, let's go down and talk to Hagrid. Hagrid knew all this. This is what Harry wants to confront him on. Okay? They go down, and they hear weird noise. Hagrid shows them a letter. Now, something we haven't talked about is the whole thing with Buckbeak, and the trumped up charges against them, and, you know, the Committee for the Disposal of dangerous magical creatures, you know, has had their little show trial. Page 217, we're told, we know you're not responsible, but, you know, there is good, we are going to uphold the official complaint, and now we'll have to have a hearing. This matter will therefore be taken, page 218, to the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures. All right. So they go down, Hagrid's in tears. And notice what happens at the end of the chapter. So they talk with Hagrid, and they kind of buck him up, make him feel better, and we're told, bottom of 221. In response to what Hagrid said, middle of the page, Hagrid went quiet for a moment because they're talking about Hagrid being sent to Azkaban. He went quiet for a moment, staring into his teeth, and he said, thought of just letting Buckbeak go, trying to make him fly away. But how do you explain to a hippo hippogriff it's got to go into hiding? And, and I'm scared of breaking the law. I don't ever want to go back to Azkaban. Describe Hagrid physically. He's medicine. He's a giant compared to any of us. OK, 
say maybe not to his brother, but he's a giant. We're told his hand is the size of a trash can lid. Think of a 55 gallon drum trash can. You know, about 20, 22 inches in diameter. Look at this desk. Look at my hand on that desk. And now make head. So how big does that make everything else? So his head probably touches the ceiling. He's got to go sideways to go through the door. And he's afraid to go back to his place. The trip to Hagrid's, though far from fun, had nevertheless had the effect Ron and Hermione had hoped. Though Harry had by no means forgotten about Black, he couldn't brood constantly on revenge if he wanted to help Hagrid. Okay. He couldn't brood on revenge. <coughs> what is revenge born of? What's its source? What emotion produces it? Hatred. Right? He couldn't brood on revenge if he wants to do what? If he wants to help Hagrid. What does the desire to help come out of? What emotion? Love. And we did it right there. This battle that wages in Harry in this book and we're going to see this battle actually wage book one through book seven. And I'm going to get something away. There were two scenes in book seven. One at the beginning and one at the end. That are, and I've not seen them, but I've had numerous students tell me that this is true. Both scenes are left out of the theatrical release versions of the seventh film and the eighth. The first scene from the beginning of the book is left out of the opening of film seven. The scene at the end of the book is left out of, and it's not the epilogue, is left out of the eighth film. And they're both scenes that involve this rather than this. They're both scenes where Harry makes a comment and it's, it's clear. It's what books one through six are building towards. And for some reason, they're left out. And keep in mind, J.K. Rowling, not J.R. Tolkien, was a creative consultant on the films. That is, she had to approve what they wanted to do. I have no idea why she allowed these two scenes to be left out. So, um, Christmas comes. They get their presents, and what does Harry get this year? He gets a firebolt. What's a firebolt? Yeah, it's it's the hottest broom there is. It's like a McLaren or a Maybach, you know, depending on your idea of expensive cars, you know. It's it's a really souped up broom. And what happens immediately? Like within a day or two of getting it. Who shows? I'm going to use the impersonal plural form of the pronoun their true colors. Hermione, right? What does Hermione do? She tells McGonagall. Why? She's suspicious. What does she assume? What does she think? Oh, Sirius Black sent you this problem. He's trying to kill you. So McGonagall has to take it and do all kinds of tests on it. Meanwhile, Harry's really angry at Hermione. Okay. So Harry has his first anti-dementor lesson with Lupin. I'm trying to go through this a lot quicker. And Lupin teaches him <coughs> what charm, what spell. So 
specto patronum. What's that mean? It's Latin. Okay. Those are the roots, or those are the parts. X out of or from pect, chest, pectoralis, chest, or you could say heart. In the O ending means I. I the agent. Okay. When you learn Latin, you know, first Latin you usually learn is something like emo, amas, amat. It's the first conjugation for one of the verbs, I love, you love, he, she, it loves, okay? Patronum, patron, and the um is just a date of ending. How do you define a patron? What's a patron of the arts? What's a patron saint? They're kind of different. A patron of the arts is a supporter of the arts. That's someone who writes a check so that a symphony can go on, or an orchestra can keep playing, or a museum can stay open, etc. Okay? A patron saint isn't just a, hey, keep, you know, good job, keep going there. It's a defender, a protector, a deliverer, a savior, has all of those means. Deliverer, protector. Guardian, Savior, I don't remember the other phrase I used, other word I used. So, put the two together, I, from my chest, a protector, Savior, etc. That's what it literally means. However, we put all this to mean, I expect. Bet, I want, I need, I assume, I presume. That's what we mean by the word expect. What? A protector, savior, deliverer, etc. So if you do this spell properly, out of your wand is going to come what? A patronus. Something that will shield you, protect you. So if you had your choice of patronuses, what would you want? If you're going up against, you know, something deep, dark, evil, mysterious, you want a kitten, you want a frog, you want a toad. No, you want something big and massive. What does Harry get? A stag. Okay. We're going to see other Patronuses in the novel. What is, you know, Lupin's? Yeah, well, you would think he'd be a wolf because of his name. But his name is Lupin because he's a werewolf. Um, we're going to see a cheetah. Later on, we're going to see another stag. Somebody has, I think it's Hermione, has an otter. Really? An otter? What, you know, what's it going to do? Roll over and act cute and stuff? Distract you? So, Lupin puts him through his spells, his paces. The bogger comes out. Harry sees the Dementor, and he tries it. Not Harry, not Harry. Please, I'll do anything. Stand aside, silly girl. Lupin, you all right? Nah, Harry, you're not old enough for this. Harry, let's keep going. Gives him a bit of chocolate, tries it again. This time, the recording goes farther back. Page 240. Lily, take Harry and go. It's him. Go run, I'll hold him off. The sounds of someone stumbling from a room, a door bursting open, a cackle of high-pitched laughter. Harry, I heard my dad. You heard James? Uh, you didn't know my dad, did you? Because he hears, wait, you referred to my dad as James. I did, as a matter of fact. We should stop. No, let's keep going. Okay. And what does Harry do? He gets this little wispy thing. Lupin, but pretty good, Harry. Page 242. If you knew my dad, you must have known Sirius Black. What gives you that idea? Oh, sorry. Nothing. I mean, they were friends at Hogwarts. Yes, I knew him. Or I thought I did. 
So here he leaves, 243. Terrible though it was to hear his parents' last moments replayed inside his head, these were the only times Harry had heard their voices since he was a very small child. Think about that sentence for a moment. He hears the voices replayed in his head. This was the only time he'd heard their voices since he was a small child. Not true, right? Because he's not literally hearing these voices. These voices are what? They're memories. It's just the first time he's tapped into these memories. And he thinks to himself, he'd never be able to produce a proper Patronus if he had wanted to hear his parents again. He wants to hear his parents again. What's he see when he looks in the mirror of Arisen? sees himself surrounded with his family. Ron sees himself head boy, Quidditch team captain, the whole nine yards. But he doesn't see his family now. Harry sees himself surrounded by his family. And his family are all what? Dead. Does that mean, if it expresses your heart's deepest desire, Harry desires to be with his family? Dead. They're dead, he tells himself. They're dead, and listening to echoes of them won't bring them back. It's kind of a way of saying he'd like to bring them back. He'd like to see them. Get a grip on yourself. All right? So we're going to skip a bunch again. Page 247. He and Lupin are back at practice. And Harry says, 246, I thought a Patronus would, I don't know, you know, charge the Dementors down or something. Lupin, it will, the true one. Harry, you've achieved a great deal, right? <clears throat> so Lupin asks, uh, Harry asks, what's under the hood? That is, what's revealed when a Dementor pulls its hood up? And he says, they give the Dementors kiss. Got to be some kind of mouth there. They kill? Oh, no, no, no. Much, much worse. They suck your soul out. We're going to see later on in a book, somebody is going to say, oh, too noble to kill me? And the other person is going to reply, no. No, just death's, death's too easy for you. And it's implied. It's not said. That the person who says, death's too easy, is kind of suggesting, no, you're going to get the Dementor's kiss. That is, you won't be fully dead, but you won't be alive either. The Dementor's kiss is very similar to what we're going to be introduced to in the next book. The unforgivable curses. Why? Because it kind of puts all three into a ball. It's not about a cadaver because you don't die. But are you really alive if there's no you there? Interesting question. We're going to see somebody who's really close to this state in book five. Right? That's where I was going. <laughs> really close. Okay, let's um, skip Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. Snape's grudge. So what is Snape's grudge? Why does Snape hate Harry's father so much? Keep going has nothing to do with books five, six, or seven. Four, five, six, or seven. We're told in this one. What did Harry's father do? He saved his life. Sirius Black kind of lured Snape 
because Snape saw Lupin go into the Whomping Willow. Sirius Black kind of taunted him, so Snape would get, and James stopped him. Very similar, not physically, not, you know, in terms of an action, but very similar to what Harry does in the first book when he stopped Malfoy from going close to the unicorn that has the coral sucking his blood. Harry saved Draco's life there. James saved Snape's life. Right? And Snape couldn't forgive him for it. So, Harry gets caught with the Marauder's Map. Snape tries to make the Marauder's Map reveal its secrets. And how does it talk to Snape? He calls him a greasy, slimy git and a bunch of other things. And, you know, not good. Lupin rescues Harry and says, page 290, Don't expect me to cover for you again, Harry. I cannot make you take Sirius Black seriously, but I would have thought that what you have heard when the Demetrius draw near you would have had more of an effect on you. Your parents gave their lives to keep you alive, Harry. A poor way to repay them, gambling their sacrifice for a bunch of magic tricks. Why? Because he snuck into Hogsmeade. And he played a practical joke on Malfoy, and he had to run back to Hogwarts, and he got caught by Snape. Right? Quidditch final. They get a note from Hagrid. Buckbeak lost his Appeal, hearing, you could say. Uh, that's all I want to say there. Chapter 16, Trelawney's Prediction. Page 324. What's the prediction? Dark Lord Surin is going to rise. He's going to help the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord will come back. The Dark Lord lies alone and friendless, abandoned by his followers. The servant has been chained these 12 years. Okay, so these 12 years. <coughs> this is book three, right? So 11, 12, Harry's 13. Okay. So the servant has been chained for 12 years. So Harry was one when the servant was chained, right? Tonight before midnight, the servant will break free, set out to rejoin his master. The Dark Lord will rise again with the servant's aid, greater, more terrible than ever he was. Tonight, and it rewinds and plays again. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. They find scabbers. Bottom uh, pages 330, 331. Um... Crookshanks is kind of going crazy about Scabbers, 333. They follow. They go into the Whomping Willow because Ron gets carried by the big dog. And they're in the Shrieking Shack. Ron says 338. It's a trap. He's the dog. He's an Animagus. And there's Sirius Black. Right. He takes their wands from them. Harry goes after him, 340, forgetting magic entirely, we're told. All Harry knew was that he wanted to hurt Black, etc., etc. Black, bottom of 341, going to kill me, Harry? He says, you don't want to. Got to get the full story. Lupin shows up. What is reminding you? That here I come before you. Harry and Ron have no idea what she's talking. She makes clear he's a werewolf. And so Lupin explains, 353, Dumbledore became headmaster. Being a werewolf, he, how's he, um, how does society deal with him? It's really interesting. Being a werewolf in this society is like being what today? COVID positive. I mean, I've got a, I had a negative COVID test two weeks ago. 
in order to have my surgery tomorrow, the anesthesiologist is requiring another COVID test today. It's like, we don't want to have anything, you know, to do with you. It's the whole quarantining, the, the shying away from kind of a thing. Why? Because werewolfism can be passed on. No. You, you can only get it from being bitten by a werewolf. All right? So, they talked about Snape. Snape shows up. What do the kids do about Snape? 360, 361. Because here he goes and stands in front of Sirius Black. When Snape points his wand at him, they use the Expelliarmus charm or spell on Snape. That's what? That's an expellable offense, right? You use the spell on a teacher. Not just any teacher. You kind of get the impression, you know, Flitwick would probably go, oh, they're just practicing. You know, it's okay. This is Snape. He's pretty vindictive. All right? So, page 368. They've made Peter Pettigrew show. Show from what? He's scabbers. He's Ron's rat. Whose rat was he before he became Ron's? He was Percy's. She never, unless she does in, in Pottermore, she never follows that up. Okay? Whose was he before he was Percy's? Has he been in the Weasley family this whole time? I'm not sure. Okay? But anyway, Black says... You haven't been hiding from me for 12 years. Well, there's that 12 years. So, is Peter Pettigrew the servant of the Dark Lord that has been chained for 12 years, metaphorically, chained to this shape? I'm going to argue no. He just, you know, he fits, like Snape does in the first book, he fits the type. He fits the profile. Without saying anything else, though, there's another servant. Okay? You've been hiding from Voldemort's old supporters. I heard things in Azkaban, Peter. They all think you're dead, or you have to answer to them, etc. Okay? Peter says, I've never heard a hair, page 370, of Harry's head. Why should I? Black, because you never did anything for anyone unless you could see what was in it for you. Voldemort's been in hiding for 15 years. So 13, subtract 15, that's minus two years before Harry was born. Okay? And then we're going to be told, um, Sirius goes on and talks about why he retained his sanity, he and Lupin forgive each other. For what purpose? Okay, but why did Lupin ask forgiveness of Sirius? What did he think about Sirius? That he was the one who betrayed the Potters. And Sirius asked Lupin for forgiveness because he thought he was the one who betrayed him. All right? Peter says to Harry, page 374, your father would have shown me mercy. And then he appeals to Sirius. What could I have done? I was scared, Sirius. I was never brave like you and Remus. What was there to be gained by refusing him? That is, by refusing to give the Dark Lord what he wanted. And what does Sirius say? Innocent love. Now, obviously, who does he mean? Surface literal level. James and Lily. But there's a lot of other innocent lives, right? Why did Sirius go to prison? Because 13 muggles died. He was accused of the crime of killing 13 muggles. What did we find out? Peter Pettigrew did that. Those muggles were innocent lives. Right? He would have killed me, Sirius. Then you should have died. 
Notice he doesn't stop there. You should have died. You should have taken one for the team. As we would have done for you. Not now. Because <laughs> now what are he and Lupin getting ready to do? You know, it's kind of like they're polishing their wands. <laughs> we would have died for you then, Peter. And it's kind of interesting. If you go back in... Books six and seven, where we find out a little bit more about the past in these four kids in school. You got to wonder why would Peter Pettigrew, a friend of James, Sirius, and Remus, he doesn't, he's not their caliber, right? He's, he's not, you know, cool like they are. He's, you know, the dumb little fat kid who just, you know, tags along. Almost like he's there for the comic joke. All right? Okay, it's 8.55. So, um, what we'll do is when we, whenever that is, when we come back, today's Wednesday, a week from today, after fall break, we're going to finish this for about the first 15, 20 minutes. Then we'll get into... Um, Goblet of Fire, but, big but, that is, we're going to spend about first 15, 20 minutes talking about it, but I will put a quiz up. I've done the Chamber of Secrets quiz, correct? Okay. <laughs> My brain is fried. Um, I'll put a quiz up to be due Sunday night, okay, for Azkaban, all right, the entire thing. Okay. We would be, but I'm having surgery tomorrow. Okay. So you're more than welcome to come. I can, you know, arrange to have the door open. 